Awesome. Well, we are going to give this a little bit. I see Sophia in there uh, before we get started. So we've got somebody who knows way more about product tours than I do. Uh, Natalie, why don't you introduce yourself first? Yeah, um, I'm Natalie, head of growth in Nevada. As Mark said, I always joke, I think I have like a special section of my brain now dedicated just to product tours and product tour best practices. <laughs> the amount I've made, seen, analyzed. So I'm glad that this endless knowledge just stuck in my brain can uh, be useful. Uh, and even if it's just a small part of your brain, you're really smart. So I'm sure it's a pretty big, small part. So we're good there. So when Natalie and I were prepping for this, what we were thinking of doing was almost having this like a, a live podcast recording. So we've got an outline of all the things that we want to cover. Uh, but I'm sure there are things that everyone in the chat is wondering that maybe we didn't have in this outline. So this is meant to be a conversation. Chime in in the chat whenever you have questions. And uh, I will make sure to answer as many as we can. Uh, mostly Natalie will answer them since she's smarter than I am. But if I can answer them, I will answer them too. Uh, sweet. So let's get started then. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, product tours have really been all the rage, I would say, for what feels like in my LinkedIn feed at last, uh, at least the last year plus. And I think you know we're a Nevada customer, uh, and Natalie was wildly helpful uh, with helping us create our first product tours, but. If you don't have somebody like Natalie, uh, or you're lucky enough to have somebody like Natalie, uh, it can be very daunting, and you, you don't really know where to get started and how to make it all work. Uh, and sometimes staring at a blank product tour slate, uh, it's stressful, it's overwhelming, and uh, you kind of get stuck. So what we're hoping to do by way of uh, this masterclass is just kind of share what Natalie's seeing of, of what works, uh, how to do it, and then most importantly, how to create product tours that convert. Sound good, Natalie? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. So let's set some context first. And thank you for suggesting this because I totally missed this part when we were preparing for the, the outline. So why do people need product tours? I think, you know, some companies have videos on their site and they think they think that they're good enough. But like, why is a product tour the right move for B2B marketers? Yeah, I always equate it as think of yourself as a buyer. Like that's actually how I first got involved in the paddock was I was a common buyer of software and was just so sick of the process. And now think of how many prospects that you have that have gone through the same thing, like long times to wait and actually see the demo or just no product information besides some blurry screenshots on a website. I think we've moved into a phase where we're all expert buyers, right? Like we all learned during COVID how to basically become little detectives and do our own research. So rather than gating as much as possible from the buyer, it's basically just like, why need product tours so we can let them buy the way they want to buy? And I think one of the things that I had to try and get over personally at Metadata, and then I definitely had to convince a whole lot of people at Metadata to get over as well, was this. You know, you add a product tour, you're essentially showing off your product on your site and anyone can see it, including your competitors. So how do you help people get over that hump too? Yeah, I hear that a lot. I think the first thing I say is like, one, think about how much you already know about your competitors. Like, I know I've seen demos of my competitors. I know their pricing structures. Like, you just kind of, you find a way to gather that information. But on top of all that, product tours really should not be the full product. If anything, I was using this metaphor the other day, but it's kind of like an appetizer, right? Like, it should be small and enticing and get you excited about the main meal or the demo in this case but I haven't eaten lunch so now I'm even more hungry than I already was but I keep going yeah <laughs> exactly just like a little taste something to get you excited we've heard customers say a little snack before which I thought was so cute but really our and the data also shows that our best performing demos are about eight to 15 steps which is about 30 seconds to a minute so you're not showing your whole product in 30 seconds to a minute what it is doing is it's just validating to the person okay this does what it says it does I get a high level understanding of the value it checks the boxes, okay, I do want to move forward versus like, I feel like sometimes we've all signed up for a product and then we got into the demo. I'm like, whoa, this does nothing. I imagined I entirely misinterpreted this and I just wasted two weeks trying to figure out what this does. No, who's ever done that? I've done that a lot. Uh, yeah, and I think for me, like when I was you know doing this at Metadata, I was looking at it from the perspective of let's try and weed out the wrong people up front by having this product tour on the site. Like, yes, you want to attract the right people and get them to convert, but you want to show off enough so that if it's not right for somebody, 
you're not going to waste their time. More importantly, you're not going to waste your sales team time and you're you're getting the right people to, to book a demo at the end of it. So I think there's a, a win-win on both sides. Now, one thing, and I'll, I'll answer this after I ask you this uh, slightly harder question, but one thing that everyone is probably thinking right now is, will my sales team be okay with this? How do you, you know, convince sales that, hey, we're not going to steal your thunder? Because it is a, a common objection that, that we got at Metadata, and I know that many other B2B marketers get too. So one thing that's funny is we often hear marketers say this, and then marketers bring it in-house. And then the sales team, especially like specific DDRs, will start just picking it up because they've heard, you know, they reach out to a customer or they reach out to prospects and they get a response like, okay, but what does your product do? Send me a one pager, show me what it does. So BDRs get really excited because instead of just a generic one pager, it's like, okay, no, I can actually show you. And generally what we recommend is if you're really hesitant, like give it to a little, I call it a little tiger team, like give it to a few BDRs, sales reps, AEs that are really excited, let them use it a few times show some data that, okay, one, this didn't scare off prospects, two, these were faster sales cycles, or we got more meetings booked. And then I think it gives everyone a little more comfort. Um, but on top of all that, like I said, I think you put it perfectly, we're like, this should get the best fit customers to you. It's going to eliminate the amount of time you need to spend on those first meetings, just giving a high level harbor tour and actually dive right into the value on that first call. And as everyone's like looking to be more efficient, it basically just makes sure the best customers get to you faster. So it's funny that the way that you started your answer, because that's exactly what happened here at Metadata. I kind of got in my own head of, hey, I think this is going to piss sales off. We're going to ruffle some feathers. I'm not sure if they're going to be okay with this. And when I went to the core kind of tiger team, I have a uh, probably about three to five AEs that I work with to test things out first. They were all super excited. And I was not expecting that. So I think, you know, B2B marketers are guilty of this all the time of kind of getting in their own heads. I wouldn't necessarily worry about that as much. Now, you've got to make sure that sales uh, is aware of this uh, when you're putting it on the site. I'm not suggesting that you do it blindly, uh, <laughs> but uh, don't worry about uh, stepping on their toes too much uh, if you do it well. And we'll get into how you uh, create a product tour uh, that can actually convert uh, right here next because you got to guide people a little bit. You got to give them just enough of the appetizer. You don't want to give the main entree. If you're giving the main entree, then you probably will piss your sales team off. Uh, I definitely would not recommend doing that, uh, but we'll get into the appetizer here next. So getting started, I remember, you know, getting the kind of the mandate from up top that we needed to add, you know, product tours to our site. Um, but I didn't really know where to get started. It's like, you know, your product well, but then how do you explain it very succinctly in, you know, uh, a clickable, like short interactive tour. And I really didn't know where to start. So I'll chime in with some of my own experience at the end, but how do you recommend people get started? Where should they be looking at? Like what's step one and two? Yeah, this is actually a good opportunity to loop your sales team in a pretty like organic way and get a little more of their buy-in is just ask them, you know, if you could only show two things on a demo, well, what would you show? Or like, what are the two moments in your product that makes prospects face light up the most? And if you're PLG, you could also use like event data for that. You could see what are the features that are being used the most. But then one, again, you kind of got in the sales team looped in, but then you have an idea, okay, these are my main aha moments. And from there, we recommend storyboarding it out. So it's kind of like making an outline, a little presentation before you put, you know, what am I going to show? What am I going to say with it? Get that approved internally. Again, another way to ensure that no one's going to get angry that moment you hit crush it live, like get, get the kind of the outline approved internally. And then from there, do some polishing, get some feedback and you can put it live. But I think really going that first step and figuring out, you know, what are the most important things to show reduces a lot of time in the back end where you're not just like chopping because you realize you made a 50 step tour with way too many things. Are you talking about the first version that I made? Uh, you might be, uh, no, but I, <laughs> I think it was 49. Uh, so I think like for me, staring at the blank slate was overwhelming because there's so much that you can show. And obviously for everyone here, if you're not using a product tour tool, check out Nevatic. There are others out there, but we're not going to talk about Nevatic specifically. Um, for me, it was part getting familiar with the tool itself from a technical perspective while trying to figure out the storyboard too. So I think just the way that I learned, like I dove in like head first into Nevatic as a tool. Uh, I spent so much time in there. And then as I figured out how to use it, then I, you know, figured out what I should be doing from a storyboard perspective. Uh, 
the next product tour that I create, I will definitely be swordboarding because that is where I think uh, you can get yourself tripped up if you don't really know what you want to show, why you want to show it and how to show it uh, versus just like, oh, let's add this, let's add that. And then by the time you're done, you get to, you know, a 50 step product tour. Yeah. Two quick things on that. One is I always recommend, like you said, like build out a short one first, like choose a specific feature or just build one. And then from there, you can iterate. I think sometimes people are like, oh, I have 50 ideas and I want to show every part of my product. It's like, no, 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 just choose one thing, figure it out, build it so you can get an idea of the product. Um, and a little like cheat that I've been using recently is I actually I don't mean to be like one of those people who talk about AI a lot, but the one thing I use AI for is I will summarize demo videos or product videos. I use this cool ties tool called Summarize AI, and then it creates an outline of it. And then that I've used as my outline for demo video. So if you're like really, I know we're I'm, all I'm stealing this. I didn't even know about this. So I'm yeah. learning something. <laughs> um, that's kind of also a good way to like get, maybe get like three of your AE's best demos, make those into little outlines and then be like, oh, wow, this feature came up on all through these demos. And here's a nice little like snippet of how they explained it. So that's awesome. Uh, and I have, I actually have signed up for that tool. Uh, I've, I've meant to use it, but I'm kind of on AI tool overload right now. There's like so many tools that you can use and I have no idea how any of them work right now. So uh, that's a personal problem. I'll figure that out. So let's talk a little bit more around the strategy around product tours. And I can pull a little bit from my own experience, but like there are different types of product tours from a technical perspective. So can you kind of share a little bit about what those are? And then I'll chime in with my own experience. Yeah, I think, you know, there are some that we've kind of seen before we were even invented that there are some product tours that people homegrown that were like click through kind of very generic screenshots that people had created all the way up to full replicating your entire application sandbox environment. Um, obviously what we specialize in is somewhere in between that, which is, you know, more that marketing use case. Like that's what we see most, like actually putting on your website, like I said, giving that little appetizer sneak peek where it still is cloning the HTML and CSS of your product. It looks and feels like the real thing, but it's not necessarily screenshots and it's not necessarily like, oh, an entirely open sandbox. And we think, especially for top of funnel, you know, you're not, not be ready yet to go and just explore the entire product. Like that's kind of what a free trial PLG motion is for. But again, sometimes I feel like with screenshots, like you don't always trust that that's the actual product. It might be blurry. You can't always control the quality. It's kind of a little bit of that happy medium. Yeah, I think for us, uh, we like to take the high road. So we were using just another product tour um, platform. And I think it was, you know, okay for us at that point in time. Um, but it was really reliant on uh, just like static screenshots. It almost felt like a, a PowerPoint presentation, if you will. Uh, where you couldn't really do anything. You could see some of it, but you couldn't see how the product actually worked. You couldn't click around in there and see yourself using uh, the platform itself. So for us, that was a big requirement uh, when we started to look at other product tour platforms. And thankfully we started working together and it made it so much easier. Uh, but I think one of the things that we really, really wanted to show was not just you know a static product tour, because you can accomplish a lot of that by way of screenshots on your site. Uh, we wanted to give people a way to actually see themselves using the platform, clicking around, going backwards, going forwards, you know, kind of guiding themselves uh, instead of just you have to go step to step to step to step. Uh, nobody really has time for that. I didn't. Uh, it was a good first step, but uh, we needed to level up our product to our game. Yeah, I think I think you guys use this. One of the cool things I always love is like the text feature where you can like act like you're texting, like clicking something or typing something in. So I think it also just gives you a little bit more of that like serotonin hit. Is that the right word <laughs> as, as a user? Right? Think, like, yeah, that's, that's just a little more enjoyable than just like feeling like you're in a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, uh, I spent enough time at Accenture in PowerPoints uh, for the first two years of my life. So the less PowerPoint in my life, the better. So let's talk about product tour use cases, because I think, you know, when you're first starting out, you get excited about, you know, creating a product tour and there's just so much that you can show. And then sure enough, you get to 50 clicks later and it's like, this thing's too big. So what are the common product tour use cases uh, that you come across? 
Yeah, we ran data on this in our state of the interactive product demo. Um, and we found about like 80% of our customers are using it for that website use case. So that really is our bread and butter. So embedding it on a website, maybe on a product page. I always think of it as like on a product page, you might have an existing GIF or video, you know, embedding it there instead or linking out as a secondary CTA. Um, we often see like, take a product tour, interactive demo, explore products. Those are some of the main CTAs people use. And what way we've heard prospects describe it before and customers, it's almost like a medium intent CTA, right? Like someone lands on your website, they might not be ready this. to book a demo, but they want something, they wanna learn a little more. And I don't know about anyone else, but like, I don't know the last time I've downloaded a one page or ebook to an essay, learn a little more. Could not uh, tell you. Yes. I think I, with TikTok, I can't like read anymore. So <laughs> at least this gives me a secondary CTA that's a little more engaging and gives them a taste of the product. So even if in that moment they're like, hey, I'm not ready to buy, I now at least understand what your product does. So one of the things that I never really thought of, and it's something that we're starting to work on internally is using product tours for like internal use cases, not just external. And I think that's a huge untapped opportunity for a lot of software companies. So can you talk about some of the internal use cases too? We've seen that a lot with like um, feature launches or product launches. So especially because the nice thing about this is you're just cloning the front end of the application. So let's say that you have a product feature in beta. Sometimes maybe if it's a little buggy or not fully working or just kind of complex, right? You don't necessarily just want to give the whole company like, hey, you have beta access to it. But you could create a quick little product tour that you know will work, you know will function and it will guide them through. So they can start learning the product before it actually goes live. We see that a lot with like BDR and AE training and even like CSM training. I love that. Now, speaking of AEs and kind of jumping around a little bit, but same topic. Um, how are AEs using product tours? Because like right now, the, the Tiger team that we have at Metadata, they're they're starting to use it more in their outreach, which is awesome. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more that we can do, but how do you see AEs using product tours? The main ways are really before or after demo. So if you, and I guess the before might be sometimes a little more the BDR, but if you want to warm someone up, it's like, hey, you signed up for a meeting, just wanted to give you a quick little overview beforehand. And what this does is it lets that first call not just be again that, hey, what do you do call? Like, is this a good fit at all? You know, by the time they get to that first call, they've had some introduction. And we've seen teams spend like 30% less time on that first early stage demos because people who go in know what it is. Um, on top of that, more, again, a little more of the AE use case is they'll use it for follow-up. So rather than sending a 60-minute demo recording, which I don't know in the history of the sales cycle when I've ever actually watched that 60-minute demo recording, it's like, hey, you asked about these three specific features. You said your boss really cared about analytics. I'm going to send you a quick product tour just of the analytics portion of the dashboard that then you can send and send it to your boss. So kind of like multi-threading. Love that. And multi-threading is even more important than it used to be, just given the state of what's going on in the outside world. So the more that you can multi-thread within your accounts, the, the better off your sales team and your marketing team is going to be. So now let's get into, you know, actually creating uh, the product tour. How much of the product, you know, should you be showing in this? Uh, and I, I guess I'll have a couple of follow-up questions there, but it's always kind of striking the right balance. Yeah, so I mentioned that eight to 15 steps, which is probably going to be about like, let's say five to 10 screens of your product. So really, that's going to only be two to three main features. And what I always mention is you want to show end states, unless sometimes you want to show setting something up if you have like really simple UI or it's crazy easy to do. That's a good thing to show. But if it's a little more complex to set up, you really want to show those like, wow, aha moments. Like one thing we've advised against, like don't show logging in. Like that's not really showing any value. That sounds silly, but we've seen this before because I think people's natural states when making a product tour is they think of it like an onboarding video. So like, of course they need to show the login and then how I click this button to click this thing and to create this thing. Like, you don't necessarily need to show the three clicks of a button to the end outcome. Find the three main features and just mostly show the end outcome. Because again, this is just something to get them excited. This is not actually necessarily fully teaching them how to use the product first. It's just giving them an idea of what does the product do. Now, I think that was a mistake uh, that I made when I was first creating our, our full platform product tour at Metadata was that I thought that I needed to show like every single click to go from point A to point Z. And thankfully you helped steer the course a little bit better than I would have steered on my own. But that was a big learning for me. Like you don't have to show 
you know, every single click in a particular workflow, you're kind of just showing off the, like you said, the aha moments or like the interesting parts. Because at the end of the day, you're really just trying to spark interest and curiosity. You're not trying to replace your sales team. You're just trying to get people more excited. Exactly. And I'd say that holds true because I know people have asked about like the actual context within the text bubbles too, right? Like that should really be value focused as much as you can. We've seen customers incorporate quotes from other customers. We've seen them incorporate or from their customers or case studies or just like value driven language. You don't want to put too much in those text bubbles. You do want to keep it skimmable. We don't have like an ideal amount of text, um, but that part should really move, be more like as if if the salesperson was there on the call, you know, what would they be saying? What would those one-liners be to get someone hooked or excited or examples? It again, shouldn't be like a click, like do this, do this next, do this next. And even I've been guilty of this. I saw that's, own, that's what I did. Yeah. yeah I saw on our <laughs> home homepage demo. I think this was last week. I saw, I was like, oh my God, I have just a click this button as one of the steps. So it's hard. Yeah. It, it takes a whole mindset shift. So let's talk about writing copy a little bit, because I remember, you know, when I started with the blank slate, kind of refined everything, uh, it was organized chaos, then it became a little bit more organized, I knew that I had the steps, but then I had to write copy, and I didn't really know, mostly because I had never done it before, how to write copy, should you be clever, should you be creative, should you be, you know, direct, should you be literal, I'm sure there's a couple different ways that you can go at it, but how would you recommend that people look at copy within product tours? So I feel like the theme of this is just me saying like steal from your sales team. But again, I heard really say like, go listen to, cause they have, like, if you listen to enough sales calls, you know, they have those one-liners. They have really good ways to describe certain features or really good stories to pull in that really hooks prospects. So listen to some of those calls, maybe summarize it in an AI. But I'd say you want to keep your brand personality there, right? Like it's almost think about each text post kind of like if you're writing one LinkedIn post about that feature, announcing that feature. If you want to keep the brand personality, you want to explain the value, but you also don't want to go on too long and get too much in the weeds. Yeah. And I think for me, and it's, you know, we're still in our early stages of using product tours, but it's the balance between, you know, being literal straight to the point while still having some of that personality. I think when I, I probably went through two or three revisions of the copy, uh, Thankfully, each revision got better, but I, the first time I was super literal and I was like, this sounds boring as hell. I wouldn't click through this. Then I, you know, over indexed at the other end of the spectrum. And I was like, all right, this sounds like marketing copy. And for me, the struggle was really just how do you get that balance uh, between the two? Cause I, I think it is helpful to have some personality and not have it so dry. Uh, but also like you want to speak to the outcomes, you want to speak to the value and it doesn't need to just be, you know, cool sounding copy. Cause I was guilty of that. And last thing I'll say on that too, something that really helps is also variation. Like I did a customer interview series with one of our customers and we're not huge emoji users at Nevada. You can have your own brand preferences, but I really loved the way that they used emojis because it was really was signaling like, oh, they're talking about, you know, revenue growth. There's a upgraph. But as I was going through the demo, those emojis dig signal in my head, like I should pay attention to this point. So I think another mistake we see, and even again, I've been guilty of is all the text is the same variation or the same like weight it's the same spacing it all looks the same so trying to have some variation some bolding maybe some emojis if that's part of your brand language that also helps kind of break it up a little bit yep yeah i'm it's funny uh katie ray's here uh she's the best but she also uh looks at our tone of voice doc and gives me shit for it all the time because it's it is very uh Thorough, I guess, is the best way of saying it. There are no rules about emojis in there, but I'm generally not an emoji person. But I did actually find myself using emojis in our product tour just because it helped break it up a little bit. And then it can help reinforce some of the points that you're making in a playful way. So uh, I never thought that I'd be an emoji person, but here we are in product tours and here's Mark using them. So all is good there. So Here's one thing that I'm totally expecting you uh, to school me on. I know there will be more of these before we get the, over with this, like measurement and analytics. I think so much of what I was worried about was, you know, getting the product tour together, getting it live, making sure people are using it. But like measurement for me, for a variety of reasons, has kind of been an afterthought. So how do you recommend people look at measurement? And then I've got a few follow-up questions from there. Yeah, this was... I was going to say this next as far as like copy and how was, do I know if it's too long? I think the biggest thing is get something out there that you feel comfortable with, that you've gotten approved. And then after probably a few weeks, maybe a month to be safe, depending on how many website visitors you get, 
we don't have a magic number, but I would say I feel pretty comfortable with like 100 people viewing it. Um, see what the drop offs are. And you should be able to see that from, you know, within that actual demo, you know, how many people are making it throughout the steps. If you're noticing a huge drop off around step seven, maybe that copy is not enticing. Maybe that's a difficult, you know, maybe it's like a weird way you position the modal and it's not as intuitive. So really look out for that. Um, and then on top of that, you know, comparing if you do have maybe multiple projects, maybe you created from from different product pages, comparing across the boards, okay, which ones are getting the most visitors, which ones are getting highest completions and conversions. And then you can maybe see, you know, did I design this demo differently than this demo? Or maybe that's even a product indicator of like, hey, this one product page gets a lot more conversions than this one. Like maybe this is clearly the market is super interested in this product. So... I imagine, you know, it's dependent on getting enough data and enough is going to vary depending on traffic and how many people are actually, you know, starting the product tour. But as a general rule of thumb, do you think people should look at, you know, two months or not two months, two weeks, you know, maybe a month, uh, maybe a little bit more than that? Like how soon before they jump in and maybe start re-architecting things too early? Because marketers love data and I know that they want to optimize things. Yeah, I'd say, like I said, about two weeks to a month and then about 100 visitors. But I will say is if you're not, you know, compare that to your website traffic too, right? Like if you have a really low, like if you're a very small niche ICP, you might not be getting as much website traffic. So everyone knows their own thresholds. But if you're a weekend and you're noticing it's significantly not getting any traffic, that also might be a place to consider, like, did we put this in the correct place on the website? Like one point that I was going to mention earlier is we've seen demos that are above the fold get 3.5 amount of the engagement as demos below the fold. So wow. maybe don't, you know, tweak too much just early on, but it would be good to check in a week after and say, you know, is this getting eyeballs? And if not, why? And maybe can we make some adjustments there? Because if you're not getting any eyeballs on it, what's kind of the point of having it? So unplanned question, but I know you'll nail this one. So it's talking about eyeballs and trying to get more eyeballs on it. So how do you recommend that people promote product tours so that they can get enough eyeballs in the first place? Yeah, we've seen a lot of customers. And this kind of goes also back to the question of like, maybe your sales team isn't fully comfortable putting it on the website just yet. You know, putting it in, you know, email campaigns, LinkedIn campaigns, ad campaigns. One thing I love is super easy. You can do right away is add as a site link on your Google ads campaigns. So it's across all of them. It takes about two clicks. I'm going to I'm gonna do that after we get off this. I'm not doing that. And I'm disappointed myself, but keep going. <laughs> um, I've seen that that's been one of our highest converting site links. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Like, especially for those high intent keywords. So start just putting it in places. I always say that you might already have an existing product video or that you might be listening to an existing product page. And then that's when you can start getting that data, seeing what works. And then that one might be more comfortable to then go put it on the website. I love that. You just gave me a couple ideas. Now, it's a little easier for us at Metadata uh, because right now we've got really three products, two of which have product tours, uh, but we haven't really done a whole lot of thinking yet about how to you know, organize these product tours because of the fact that we have multiple product lines. So I'm sure you all work with companies that have tons of different products and industries and personas like can probably get pretty messy very quick if you're not thinking through how to structure all that. So what advice can you share on how to do that? Yeah, I think it depends on how many product lines you have. So the very simplest version, if you, I say like if you have two main ICPs or different personas, so one great example I like to give is Qualifies, a company of ours, their recruiting platform, they have a very different product for the recruiter versus the candidate. It can be a very different experience. So they start their demo with just a simple question, are you a recruiter or a candidate? And then depending on what button you click, you'll get a different experience. So if you have that type of dichotomy, like two really main, but very different personas, I think the branching buttons at the beginning does well. I think once you get past like four or five, the branches, it can get a little overwhelming. That's where what you guys do, the checklist can really come in handy. Um, and we have seen checklists improve completion rates by about like 17%. And I think it's just because our brain likes to check things off, right? Too. Yeah, you feel like you're accomplishing something and it's like, all right, I'm making progress. Exactly. You're like, I want to explore more. I want to feel like I'm seeing it. Um, so that's a good way. That's just a little button on the bottom where it pops up and shows you all the different options. Also nice as a prospect, you might come in looking like, for example, one of our customers ramp, you might come in just looking for a card and then you go to their little checklist and you see, oh, they also have accounting functionality. I didn't even know they had that, but I need that. So a way to explore. Um, and I think my favorite option for how do you show different product tours and one we're seeing pop up more and more is a demo library. 
So right, basically, keep talking about this because this is what I want to get to. I'm very jealous of companies that have product tour libraries. So take it away. Yeah, this is basically a landing page on your website that just has, let's say, we've seen usually it's about six to nine different demos of different feature functionality. Again, usually the individual demos are only like eight to 15 steps. And the really elite demo libraries will also have filtering functionality. So if you say like, oh, I care about this industry or these this use case or this problem space the most, you can go to that page, filter it down, kind of like a really good, the way I think of it, it's a really good um, like blog where mm -hmm. they have you know a bunch of blog posts and then you can filter to exactly what you want. This kind of looks the same where you can filter it down and just say like, okay, these are the exact features I'm looking for. Now I can go click through a 15 step, 30 second demo and then easily explore other ones. Yeah, and I think that was one of the ways that I, one, learned how to create a product tour, but two, kind of got inspired by what I was seeing. So I checked out the, uh, basically like the customer library that you all have on your site to see how others are doing it. I think you mentioned Ramp. That was one of the examples that I loved how they set theirs up. I think that may have been my favorite out of all of them in there. Uh, but it's one of those things that like most things in marketing, there's a million different ways that you can skin this. There's not necessarily like a right way or wrong way. But I think for me, by looking at all of those different examples in the library, I was able to kind of pick the, the best of each of them of what I liked to kind of form into my own. Uh, so that was a super helpful starting point. And I think something that helped me get unstuck uh, because I was very much stuck by myself of overcomplicating things and uh, getting way too excited. Yeah. And anyone who's talked to our team is probably like sick of hearing about some of these examples. <laughs> but if anyone is working with the team, they know that we're happy to share customer examples. Even if you ask like, oh, I'm interested. Do you have a demo that shows this? Or for this use case, generally we have something we can pull. And for the people who are uh, here right now, make sure to drop questions in the chat. We will definitely cover them too. I know that Natalie and I are we're good at talking and can probably talk for way longer than the time that we have, but we want to make sure that we're helping everyone here who's attending. So you know, uh, answer this question as if you're not talking to me, because I probably made a lot of these, but what are common mistakes that people make the first time that they're creating a product tour? Um, I think one mistake we see is people want to do too much at once. Like they get so excited and they're like, oh, I'm going to use it for every single use case. I'm going to build it out for every single product. And as we talked about, eventually get there, definitely. But just learn the platform, practice building out one, figure out one main use case so that also, because that's going to limit the scope of how much, obviously, you want other team members' feedback and approval, but it's also going to limit maybe how much approval you need for everything and let you just get started and experiment with it quickly. Um, I think another big thing, we kind of talked about the login state, but be I can't careful. believe that people do that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, you know, like, just don't be careful that you're not thinking of it like a how to, especially more for the website use case, right? If you're using it for support use case, feel free to make it more how to. That's a very good distinction and that like yeah. a how-to product tour versus kind of an informative product tour because they're very different audiences and you're trying to do different things with them. Exactly. Yeah. Like this is, again, just getting someone excited is the main goal and driving them to CTAs. Um, I, I think that's another good learning is this should be, the goal should be driving to the main CTA, right? So like make sure you're putting CTAs throughout, make sure you're giving some of that value language. You don't, you don't want to give too much upfront. Um, yeah, I think those are some of the main ones. So this is probably one of the questions that will exist as long as B2B marketing is a thing, but should you gate product tours or should you ungate them? Yeah, this one has been hard because I think people want a really clean answer of, you know, you get 50,000 more conversions if you ungate. My honest answer is right now we are seeing about 60% ungated. And especially we recently put out a report more for like the enterprise use case and we saw actually 70% ungated. So we are seeing a slight majority towards ungated. That being said, I do really think it depends on your goal. So if your main goal is to better educate prospects about a certain product. So example, if you're putting it on the product page, you're replacing a video or a GIF. I think that makes a lot of sense to ungate, right? Like you're trying to get them to learn actively more about that product and not cause friction. Or if your main goal again is to drive more demo bookings and you want to add CTAs throughout the tour, then ungated. But if you want a way to get some interest and be able to nurture these people, maybe you have a really complex product and you know it needs multiple touch points to get in touch with them, then I think it's okay to gate. I will say we have been 
experimenting with some customers, putting the gate maybe after the first five or seven steps, like give them just a little something to get excited about. And then. So how does that work? Because I'm interested in that from an experiment perspective. Yeah. So using our form functionality, you can just basically turn like the seventh step into a form. Mm -hmm. So if they want to move forward, you could just put a form there. I've seen that before with content where people will essentially give away the content and then at the end be like, if you really enjoyed this content, feel free to su subscribe to get more of it. And I've only seen it a few times, but I've found that the people or the companies who are doing that generally create good content and I'm more likely to fill uh, the format at the end of it to get more stuff like that. So it would probably work on me. I'm curious if I should try that out with metadata too. And what we've seen is they usually hint to like, if you want to see more of the product tour, right? Like maybe you just give seven steps, like really overarching, what does the product do? But if you want to dive deeper, then you have to give your information. I dig that. Now we talked through goals and measurement a little bit, but let's talk through what B2B marketers are always on the hook for, which is measuring success and showing impact. So how do you like even go about that conversation? And then I've got plenty of questions to grow you on. Yeah, I think the biggest thing we see marketers measuring on is website conversion rates, and especially not just immediate, like you should be seeing more, you know, if you're having another place for people to click your CTA, more CTA conversions, but also down funnel interactions. So we talked before, like this should kind of cut out that first introductory step. You know, are you seeing leads that go through the interactive demo tour? Are they having faster sales cycles? Are they having a higher win rate than others? Um, so first, from a marketing perspective, I think the easiest thing to start is measuring that click-through rate. Like, is this CTA having a higher click-through rate and higher conversion rate than maybe existing CTAs or other assets on your website? And then beyond that, if you can measure, if your sales-led, what is the sales impact? If your product-led, am I getting more activated, paid, and free trialers? So I imagine, and I'm, I'm pulling from experience of using uh, chat on our site. So we used to use Drift, now we use Qualified, but so much was really dependent on the drop-off rate in the first, like, let's say first step or first two steps. And then, you know, if a lot of people were dropping off then, then the rest of it really doesn't matter because not enough people are seeing it. So are you constantly experimenting with, you know, the first like step or two, or maybe three at the beginning to make sure that you're not losing people from the jump? That's a really good question and probably honestly something we should be doing more. What we do see is about- <laughs> To be fair, for everyone who's here, that was unplanned. I just thought of it because of something that Natalie said, but I'm not trying to- <laughs> uh, Oh, no, hard. no. <laughs> um, I think they, we could always be testing more, but what we see generally is about 30 to 50% completion rate is mm -hmm. on average and kind of in that pretty healthy bucket. So I think once you hit that, like obviously keep testing, keep optimizing, but if you're mm -hmm. in that 30, 50% completion rate, you're in a pretty good spot. Then from there, that's when you should work more on like, okay, then as conversion rates higher. And we generally do see if you have a higher completion rate, you probably have a higher conversion rate. You know, if they're making it to the end, they're probably getting value. Um, so yeah, obviously keep testing, but if you want some more of our stats, we do have kind of all of our benchmarks and that say the interactive product demo for it. So you can kind of get an idea of like, okay, am I in the benchmarks rather than just feeling like you're going crazy, constantly having to optimize. So in the follow-up for this, we will definitely send out the benchmark report that you all put together. There's a lot of really good information in there. I thought it was super informative. So I'm, I'm sure everybody else would find it helpful too. One other thing that was unplanned, uh, kind of a funny question, but related, how difficult is it working at a product tour company with people suggesting, you know, changes to the product tours that you're making? So it's funny. And maybe people are just nice. Like I don't get as much feedback on our product tour as maybe <laughs> as much as we should. I will say that the Wonder website has gone through multiple, multiple, at least 10 iterations. So we mm -hmm. are testing and trying to make it better. I think the hardest part is, as I've talked about, there are so many use cases and so many ways that I get excited about using Nevadic. I think mm -hmm. it's it's less external feedback. It's more just my own bandwidth of building product demos. And I do try to uh, heard that myself, um, like making sure that, so that's why I try to repurpose our existing ones, but mm -hmm. making sure that we are, we are trying it in new and experimental ways. So what are some maybe product tour ideas that you have and just haven't been able to get to yet because of time and everything else in your plate? Like what are some more unique ideas that you'd love to get to, to create for? 
one I did get to that I'm very excited about is like more mass personalization. So we're starting like ABM for the first time, We've done it past companies, but not really here. And we are able to insert like personalization variables so that when someone goes to, and it's very specific accounts, but when they go to our landing page, they'll see the dip, typical demo we have, but it will say like, hey, metadata, um, and then maybe they'll have their logo in it. So kind of personalization at scale, you are going to need some sort of like personalization platform for that if you want to do it at mm -hmm. scale, but you could also do that one-to-one -one direct. That's something I'm playing around a little bit more. Um, and then on top of just like A-B testing, optimizing, I'm thinking of one thing is really on my mind. And if anyone has ideas or is doing this cool ways, I'd love to hear just how we can better use the interactive demo data. So for I know I've told you about this, Mark, but on top of that ABM campaign, what we're also doing is we have a list. Since ours is ungated, we're using Clearbit to enrich it. We have a list in Google Analytics of what are the highest engaged companies with our product demo. And then we're going out and we're outbounding those companies. So I think that's what's getting me really excited is like, this is basically a whole new level of intent data that's way more intent than someone just Googled a keyword. How can we best? Oh, use this it? is like, I would say, I'm not a big believer in intent data in general because I think it's all over the place, but this is some of the, like the highest intent that you can be showing if you're clicking through product tours and you're, you know, getting, you know, 50% completion, 75% completion, or maybe completing the entire product tour. So I think there's a lot of cool things that you can do there. Um, I know we've got about eight minutes left. Uh, I haven't seen questions come through, uh, which means hopefully we're doing a good job. But if you have any questions, make sure to to ask them and drop them in the chat. I think one other thing, uh, just in general, that I'd love to get your perspective on is this: there are, and again, it's not a Nevada pitch slap here, but you know there are tons of other um, alternatives out there uh, for product tours, uh, and this is a new category of of, of tooling that a lot of people might not really know how to bet. So what kind of advice would you give to people who are looking at bringing on, you know, a product tour tool? Uh, and what are like the types of questions that they should be asking uh, while they're in that evaluation process? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we see is really what is your main goal? Like, if you remain, because I think with demos, right, people get so excited. Could I use it for onboarding and support? Could I use it for marketing? Could I use it to replace my demo environment? And I think product tours, people think her thoughts, that entire funnel of different ways they can do it. But ultimately, like there's at least, and I'll even say like as someone who works at a demo platform, I don't think anyone can solve every single use case perfectly, right? Like it's still a relatively new market. And I don't think if you're solving every single five different use cases perfectly, you're probably not solving anyone. Yes. I don't know what's better than perfect, but amazingly. It's um, like a so restaurant that has 900 things on the menu. It's like they don't really cook any of them well. Uh, maybe start a little bit smaller. Exactly. Exactly. We don't want to be, I don't know. Like the Cracker Barrel products. of product tours. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why that one came to my head. Maybe I should have tried it. But so figure out what the main goal is. And then for us, I mean, I said at the beginning, we're really that sweet spot as we see our customers using it more for that top of funnel marketing use case, sometimes BDR outreach, but really more when you want to give that snack, but you still want it to look and feel like your actual product. So if you are like, no, I want an entirely live demo environment to replicate it, um, my, that my sales team will use, you know, that's a bit beyond. If you're like, no, I just want some screenshots because I'm just, you know, I just created this product. That might be a little beyond in the other way, but I'd really figure out like what is the main goal and use case and which one of the demo providers I know can really solve that main use case. Because I think it can get tempting to be like, oh, I want everything, but. Oh, marketers, who would ever do that? Uh, AKA <laughs> exactly. All of us at some point. Yeah. Um, but no, I, Natalie, like I'll offer you up for this as well for anyone who's attending live or watches this recording, like feel free to reach out to Natalie, uh, whether it leads you to Nevada or not. Uh, she is a wealth of knowledge, as you can tell, on product tours and what to do and more importantly, what not to do when you're first getting started. Uh, because Natalie, if you were to guess, how many product tours do you think you've like looked at? Probably like 100. We actually have a Slack <laughs> channel where we launch any any new customer that goes live. We post it. So um, I feel like daily I'm seeing little updates and cool new use cases, but yeah, if anyone wants to talk product tours, I'm always more than happy. I will not, if you're not a Nevada user, I will not slight you for it. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> I just love hearing how different companies are using it, cool use cases. Cause like 
that's really how I got this knowledge was just seeing the cool things customer uses. Like, I think I have such an easy job because I have, we have such brilliant customers and then I just repurpose what they're doing. Well, and it's cool at the same time though, because like I said earlier, there are so many different ways that you can skin a product tour. You're probably seeing so many different perspectives of how all these customers are going at it. So like, I almost compare it to when I worked for a, a marketing agency, like you see so many different ways of trying to solve for the same problem that the perspective that you have by way of those hundred plus product tours, is probably unmatched because I can't imagine many other people are seeing as many product tours as you are. And I think one thing we're really lucky about is like, we tend to work with companies like metadata that are innovative, that are fast growing, that want to try the latest tech. So it's not only are we seeing a bunch of product tours, but we're seeing them from some of the best really cool marketing companies out there because they're the ones who want to be innovative and try this new technology. So it just feels cool that talking with customers sometimes I'm, I geek out as a marketer. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I get to talk to you. Uh, I did not pay Natalie to say that, I promise. Uh, but no, we are pretty much right at time. Uh, I'm out of questions. Uh, I feel like I've learned a bunch here, which is the whole intent of doing these master classes. So Natalie, thank you for joining us and thank you for sharing uh, everything that you've learned with product tours. I know I took away probably at least five ideas that I'm going to try out here in the next week or two. Awesome. Yeah. Like Mark said, if anyone has questions, please feel free to, you know, find me on LinkedIn. I'm on there way too much than I should be, but you know, that's being a marketer these days. Amazing. All right. Well, thanks everybody. We'll make sure that if you were here live or you, you were not here live, you will definitely get the recording uh, and uh, we'll see you in the next demand community masterclass. Thanks for coming by. Thanks everyone.